Welcome everyone, I'm Jim Morrison, and this week we have a special edition of the Appraisal Buzzcast. Recently, our host, Hal Humphreys, traveled all the way to the UK to visit with Chris Thorne, who's kind of an icon in valuation circles across the pond. He's been in the appraisal business for more than five decades and has truly seen it all. So here's Hal in Bristol with his guest, Chris Thorne. Enjoy. So we have a special edition podcast today. The Appraisal Buzz is on the road. Um, Kim Green and I are in Bristol, UK, and we have the opportunity today to speak with Chris Thorne. Chris, for those in our audience that don't have any idea who you are, um, tell us a little bit about how you got into this business, how long you've been doing this work, um, and, and kind of what your role is. Ah, I've been doing this uh, for probably too long. Um, I've worked out it's uh, 51 years um, just gone, but um, I started as an 18 year old uh, trainee. Um, most of my life, 35 years of that, I was um, uh, in real estate appraisal, primarily commercial, a okay. little bit of residential in the early years. Um, then I um, moved on to become technical director of the International Valuation Standards uh, Council. Uh, there wasn't such a huge leap because I had previously been involved on various RIC RICS committees. Okay. And um, among the jobs I was doing there was I was their nominee to the IVSC. So I knew, understood the IVSC and they knew me um, before uh, I became technical director. Okay. And, and what, is, what is the IVSC and what is, what is the standards that you're talking about? What well, are we're, the we're talking about the International Valuation Standards uh, Council. Um, it was formed uh, in the um, uh, late 80s originally uh, between the RICS, Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors in the UK, uh, and um, American organisations such as the Appraisal Institute and also the um, uh, ASA. Mm -hmm. um, the Australians were in there, the Australian Property Institute, and I can't remember exactly, uh, two or three other, mainly Anglophone um, countries came in originally. But it grew from there um, quite significantly. Um, it's restructured, it's now, um, uh, its standards are used to a greater or lesser extent um, across uh, 20, 30 countries in the world. Oh, wow. Uh, most of the major economies. Some countries adopt the IVS um, standards um, absolutely. Others, such as the um, uh, RSS in the UK, issues its own standards, but they closely follow the, all the principles that are in the international valuation standards as well. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, the, the um, influence of the IBS is um, f most significant and, and particularly, in, I mean, although it deals with valuations not only for real estate but also takes into account business valuation and uh, financial instruments. Um, oh, wow. Uh, it's, um, it's looking at principles of valuation and appraisal at a very high level. Um, and obviously when you're in a specific market, there may be particularly to statutory details you've got to reflect and other aspects which are unique to markets, which means valuation is so varied, unlike accounting standards, where it's just right. describing the way a entity <coughs> produces its um, financial statements. Valuation is a much broader, broader subject. So at a global level, all we can really have is the high level principles, which really apply to any type of valuation. But that makes um, sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So when we're talking about uh, international valuation standards. Um, you mentioned the RICS um, mm -hmm. standards. How does that compare to what we would in the United States call USPAP or USPAP? Well, the big difference is that um, uh, USPAP, um, I, I mean, it, the Appraisal Foundation came to existence before FIREA in, mm -hmm. I think, the late 80s, That's early right. 90s. Um, uh, but um, n ever since uh, FIREA came in, it is a statutory uh, requirement. There's statutory licensing of appraisers, um, and the foundation look after their education, and as well as just issuing USPAP. Um, in the UK, RICS has been around for, um, for I think it's uh, getting on for 150 years. 
Um, wow. Very long established. Um, over that time, it has gradually absorbed many other little professional bodies. But one of the key things, it's got the royal in front of its title um, because it does operate under a royal charter, okay. which means it has to act in the public interest. It's not something that only represents its members' interests. Um, and uh, because of that, governments over the years have tended to look to the RICS to regulate the profession. Um, there hasn't been any real legislation around the activities which um, RICS members undertake, which isn't just appraisal, it can be brokerage, it can be um, looking at building conditions, um, mm -hmm. even as the word surveyor suggests, originally it was about measuring land, right. um, which is how you start most valuation or appraisal work. Um, but uh, there's very, obviously there's lots of laws governing the way you operate any business, mm -hmm. but there's no direct uh, statutory licensing or requirements for appraisal or valuation in the UK. In the UK no. Okay, um, so the IRS, RICS basically controls its members and their ethical standards and the way they do business, but there's no statutory requirement to have a license. No, that's right. I mean, it's been trying to separate the um, uh, regulation part of its activities from the um, member education and member um, representation activities um, over recent years. Okay. Um, and it, its regulation board is chaired by, with a majority of non-member um, um, advisors. By advisors. Or, okay. uh, yeah. Um, and um, whereas, you know, the side I'm still involved in is in actually sort of creating the uh, material to help members um, apply the standards. Okay. Um, so that's sort of more the guidance notes, the um, mm -hmm. education side of it, the practical side of it. Okay. But that is quite separated from regulators. It's a, it's the, it's a philosophy which is similar to the U.S. Constitution that you separate the legislature and the executive, and uh, yeah. you've got to and the judiciary. Um, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm really curious about. So, if one were to come to the UK and say, I want to be a real estate appraiser, could they just hang out a shingle and do it without being a member of the RICS? Yes. Um, the trouble is they probably wouldn't get much business. <laughs> um, I mean, the RICS is um, very well known. It's in commercial real estate market, is, it is totally dominant mm -hmm. um, body. Um, all uh, banks and other lenders they're, of course, are regulated bodies. Uh, they have to get valuations done. Their internal controls say we've got to have it done by a properly qualified. Okay. And most of them do stipulate it has to be by an RICS firm okay. or an RSS surveyor. So, so um, there is, um, it would be very difficult. Um, I mean, RICS effectively has a monopoly, which is one of the reasons why it's, it's been trying to work in its governance to separate out the regulatory side and make it a semi-detached as it possibly can be, okay. uh, to um, avoid accusations of conflicts of interest. But it is, um, it's, it has to, it's a, it's a tightrope, but it's a tightrope it's been walking for many years. Well, I mean, RICS has been around for 150 years, plus or minus. I don't yeah. think any organization in the yeah. United States has been around that yeah, long. Yeah. I think the Appraisal Institute has been around for maybe 80, 90 yeah, yeah, years, yeah. something like that. So that's impressive. But you've also been dealing with, um, with property valuation and sales and, and, and how to transfer a title of property and mm. derive a value from the market for a lot longer time than we have in the United States. Yes. Well, You've been yeah. around a little bit longer. Well, that's right. <laughs> I mean, the RICS's origins really start, really took off with the um, expansion of the railways in the mid um, uh, 19th century okay. because to do that the land for the route had to be surveyed and measured uh, it then had to be acquired um, okay. and negotiated um, and so that brought in the appraisal side of it um, the all these were privately constructed but had to their authority came from getting a members bill through Parliament 
which is the reason why the RSS HQ is the uh, right opposite the Houses of Parliament in Parliament Square. It's actually the only privately owned um, building on that square. All the rest is government and public sector or the church. So uh, I noticed um, when I was researching, it was like the RSES headquarters is right there in the heart of yeah, everything. It is, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. But that, um, that, that comes from time. It was a very convenient place to position yourself to petition Parliament to get your railway um, bill through and so you could go ahead and acquire all the land you required. How fascinating <laughs> would it be from a valuation perspective to say, all right, we're going to build a rail line out to Devon? Yes, yeah. Um, we can look at a map, we can draw a line, we can figure out yeah, where yeah. it goes. Now we've got to go acquire this land. Yeah, from all the farmers had, and uh, yeah. landowners along the route. Yeah. Would that not have been just amazing from a from an intellectual yes, yeah. perspective? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to What is this worth? Yes, yeah. Crazy. Let me take a second and give a shout out to one of our sponsors and we'll be right back. Yeah, yeah. Need a profitable PDC solution for your clients? Jaro's appraisal management software makes the process faster and easier. With Jaro, you can order standard appraisals, inspections, and hybrids, all on one seamless platform. The software also gives you everything you need to manage new vendors by taking care of background checks and letting you shop from a pre-vetted panel of inspectors with a wide range of credentials. Get started with Jaro today at tryjaro, that's tryjaro.com. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Appraisal Buzzcast. I'm Hal Humphreys. I've got Chris Thorne here with me today. Um, as you've probably already guessed, um, Chris knows this industry inside and out. Um, he has been involved in standards creation at the international level. Um, if I'm not wrong, did you help out with USPAP at one point? Were you on a committee helping uh, out with that? Uh, no, I wasn't. But we did. I, when I was at the IBSC, we worked closely with the um, uh, Appraisal Foundation Standards Board to try and make sure that we were aligned as far as possible in our ideas and our principles. And okay. um, so, yes, it's, uh, I, I understand uh, uh, your spat reasonably well. Okay. Um, one of the things I'm curious about, and you know, as we were talking before we started the podcast, um, you know, appraisal buzz, appraisory learning primarily speaks to residential appraisers. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you don't have a lot of experience in the residential side, but residential appraisers and commercial appraisers both rely on information from other sources. Mm -hmm. uh, in the States, we have MLS, we have you know, um, public records available, and this applies to residential as well as mm -hmm. commercial. How do valuers in the UK get their information? Um, similarly, there are, particularly in the residential field, there is a lot of information. Um, one or two players are now dominant in the market. Um, and uh, they are supported by the firms who provide them with their listings. So if they're listed, you're seeing the asking prices. If the deal's been done, unless there's a confidentiality agreement, they'll normally an agreement to show the price achieved. Okay. Um, and there's also, um, although uh, in the residential market, particularly at the sort of um, lower value end, you probably have lots of local um, uh, brokers who are not don't have any valuation services of their own, uh, and. A, quite aggressively competitive with each other. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of the, as you start moving up the uh, value chain, where the bigger firms get involved, a lot of them will have appraisal and brokerage operations under the same roof. Okay. And so there's a good crosstalk about what's going on in the market. In the commercial market, that is the norm. Yeah. Um, that you, you will have um, the, the valuers and the... Um, uh, brokers, agents, working more or less side by side, and right. you know, in situations like we've had, um, been having over the last eighteen months or so, or going back to the financial crisis of two thousand eight nine, um, that sort of collaboration was very effective because um, you know the brokers could tell you at what price their clients would be prepared to enter the market, when of course all the valuers had of 
concluded deals or historic before the Lehman's crash or what have you, right. are frankly useless. Yeah. And of course, it's one of the problems with any data that's available on transactions done is bound to be historic. Even if it was just yesterday, it's in the past. Exactly. Uh, and therefore, it's looking forward at current sentiment of the market is just important. RICS does publish monthly a survey which is based on sentiment of where its members in different sectors think their market is going. And okay. they publish that. So you actually have a sentiment survey. Okay. Um, and this is one of the things which I know uh, in, on continental Europe, they, they don't get it. I've had bankers to me in places like Germany saying that we cannot uh, base our valuations on sentiment. To which I say, well, do you understand what a market value is? It is a hypothetical sell transaction on that specific date. You have to understand what's driving the market, and markets are based on sentiment. On that date. Exactly. So, you know, what happened last month, six months ago, is irrelevant. The, the, the same problem happens in the United yeah. States, um, and I think a lot of residential appraisers fall into this. You're constrained by your clients to using closed sales. Yeah, yes. And in a market like <clears throat> you said for the past 18 months mm -hmm. in the United States, we had before that this rapid increase in yes, sales yeah. price. It was not entirely supportable. Yeah. Um, and now it's kind of leveled off. But if the market's going up fast or if it's going down mm -hmm. pretty quickly, your sales are going to be, as you said, irrelevant. Yes, yeah. And I, I've often thought there has to be a way to address the sentiment, as you say, mm -hmm. of the market. And, and I've seen people address it in a number of ways. I want to get your take on this. Pending sales contracts signed today that are going to close for yeah, yeah. a couple of weeks or a couple of months, whatever. I mean, that's a really good indication. Yeah, it hasn't yeah. closed, but it's negotiated, yeah. that kind of business. Um, I love the idea of a survey of your members, RSCS mm -hmm. members, mm -hmm. which would include, I'm guessing, our, a number of brokers, members yes, of the yeah, RSCS. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've got what we in the States might call um, a home inspector, someone who deals with the yes, structural yeah. issues of the home valuers, um, their opinions are well informed. Mm. Yes, and they, they, that's absolutely right. And you know, the point I keep, you know, I keep coming back to is that valuation isn't just about the mathematics. It's not just about understanding how to construct a complex uh, discounted cash flow um, model, for example, um, or just understand the theories behind um, yeah, time value of money. All of that maths is important, but actually it's understanding the markets, it's the economics of it. And it is a collision between um, art and science valuation. Yeah. You, you yeah. cannot you know, purely analyze everything and prove it mathematically. You have to understand the context in which that calculation is being made. And that brings me to the last thing I want to talk about. But before I do that, I want to take a quick break and hear from one of our sponsors. And we'll be right back up to that. LIA Administrators and Insurance Services, serving valuation professionals since 1978. We provide e &O insurance with a commitment to superior customer service, outstanding liability education, and unmatched claim defense, benefiting over 10,000 real estate professionals nationwide. Explore our exclusive appraiser liability education by Peter Christensen and cost-effective seminars designed to foster your growth. Our underwriters, with an average of 26 years of experience each, are dedicated to supporting appraisers. Visit liability.com to discover how LIA can safeguard your business. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Hal Humphreys. You're listening to the Appraisal Buzzcast. I'm joined today by Chris Thorne here in Bristol, UK, and we're talking about valuation issues. Um, you know, we, 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 we talked about um, data sources, we talked about uh, the structure of regulation and, and how appraisers and valuers learn the business. I'm really curious in terms of, you know, the conversation between it, it is a collision of art and science. Um, we have to know how to do the math, we have to understand the math. But there's another component there, and that is 
the market, which is made up of, I'm sorry, it's made up of egos and hopes and dreams mm. and fears and all of those things. Rational people and irrational people. Rational and irrational <laughs> people. So the question is, in the States, there's a lot of talk right now about automated valuation models for residential appraisals. Um, there are some folks are saying their math is so good they don't need um, a human involved in the process anymore. Um, I think there's always going to be a place for professionals like you and me and the appraisers that listen to this podcast to not only know how to do the math, obviously that's important, it's key, mm -hmm. but to determine whether this person's rational or irrational, their decision made mm -hmm. sense or did not make sense. Do you agree with that? Do you think we're ever going to be mathed out of, out of work? Yes. I mean, I think uh, where you have markets with a large volume of very similar um, properties, you know, I'm, I'm thinking here in my head at the moment of places like Dubai, where you can have, you know, a row of 20, 50 story uh, blocks uh, with very Identical. little variation between the apartments in right. them. Right. Um, where that sort of stuff is, e even there, um, I know at the moment everything is physically inspected, but frankly, the valuation is purely done on, is so much data available which is current, everything is virtually identical. Right. Um, it's, it, it's highly automated. And in one of my clients out there I know um, has a system whereby they have their inspectors going around on site um, they just fire all the facts about the property back to the, which they can, can confirm through their visual inspection. They confirm right. it exists, which is basically the main purpose is there. <laughs> and uh, it's fired back to the office and 20 minutes later, the report's gone. And, you know, it's such a fast, highly automated process. That same firm in a commercial side doesn't go anywhere near. They, they cannot because there's so much more variety in sure. the commercial Sure. Whether that's the physical characteristics of the building, the matters about location, which have a much bigger effect on um, the value than they might in the residential market, mm -hmm. um, and you know when you've got into investments, it's the quality of the tenants, the occupiers, mm -hmm. and this sort of thing are all big factors, which are so many variables. No one, to my knowledge, um, has yet come up with a system that um, is that anyone would trust. Right. to automate commercial real estate valuation right. or high-end residential for that matter sure. you know where, where you've got so much more variation between the sort of uh, residence someone's going to be paying you know five million dollars for or what have you compared to uh, or even 50 million dollars for you know sure. uh, compared to uh, um, the, the routine sort of family housing well I think in in the states and that's what I'm most familiar with obviously but you you've got suburban tracts that have been developed with mm -hmm. with three models of home yeah. on 150 yeah, acres yeah. i think that is easy to handle with mm. math yeah. that, that's an avm mm. could be all day long but in a town like bristol where you've got historic buildings brand new buildings mm -hmm. strange little pathways that go yeah. up the yeah. thing and mm. and there may be some value attributable to being on that hidden yep, little passageway yes, yeah. that is that is not there. I, I'm not sure that an AVM works for those unique properties. No, no that's right. And, and by definition, every property is unique. Right. <laughs> <laughs> even in terms though, of location. <laughs> even, even, even though if you're in Dubai and you've got 20, you know, 20 yeah. high rises, they're all identical units on the inside. Yeah. You're on a different floor with a different yeah, aspect yeah. and everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, well, Chris, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come visit with us and do this today. I know it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot out of your busy schedule. Thank you so much for doing it. Um, anything you'd like to say about the future of the appraisal business? Um, should appraisers just give up and get out of the business or, or buckle down and, and learn more? Um, I think it's important to keep yourself relevant. And uh, therefore, um, and technology is developing all the time, um, but that doesn't mean to say we're going to end up with AVMs. I'm working with a few firms at the moment on um, report automation, 
which mustn't be confused with valuation automation, right. because um, where they're good sources of data, in the UK now, you've got public accessible, well, um, at the moment, if you want any information on what the um, permitted uses of the building and the history of uh, consent, planning consents on that building, uh, if you want to get information about from the land registry about the extent of the um, each holding, mm -hmm. Um, if you want information about its local taxation, all this sort of thing, you've got to look it up on websites. There are now tools available um, whereby you can just enter the address on your computer screen, press a button, and it will go and search all these different websites and bring back all the information. And you can then also, depending on the information that comes back, get it to choose the wording which you want to put into your report. So that all that fact gathering is now c capable of being highly automated yep. and being put into the report so you don't have to work. All you've got to think about in your report really is um, the things which you're never going to automate, which is what you think of the property, what the rationale is for your valuation and explaining how you and why you arrived at your figure. And it's just developing those skills. I, I think probably to sum it up, the most important thing for the valuers, appraisers to remember is that the focus has got to be less on the what but more on the why when you're producing your reports because um, the what is something which can be highly automated. You can make your work more efficient because you can use automation to get that information for you, mm -hmm. but you ultimately, where you add value is explaining how that is relevant to the current value of the property. I love that and we've talked a lot about relevance for real estate appraisers and at the end of the day um, a valuer a real estate appraiser at their core they should be an analyst yes we are not necessarily best used when we think about highest and best use of mm -hmm. property highest best use of our time maybe the highest and best use of our time is not going out and measuring the home and and taking the photos and, and gathering all of the facts that are hard mm -hmm. facts that are known. Maybe our highest best use is in, as you said, Chris, dealing with the why, mm -hmm. analyzing the why and reporting that to our clients. I think that's, that's a great example of how we can stay relevant. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here, Chris. No problem. <laughs>